Hello, this briefing is Threat and Error Management and it's designed really for student pilots and those studying for the sailplane pilot's license. By the end of this briefing, uh, I'm hoping that uh, you should understand the terminology used in TEM, understand what you need to be able to do to use it effectively, identify relevant threats and errors, and understand how TEM fits into your flight training. We can look at TEM as in the same way as we might look at defensive driving for a motorist. For the motorist, defensive driving doesn't teach him how to drive, it just teaches him how to reduce the risks to safety. And that is the same for aviation. It doesn't try to teach you how to fly your sailplane, but it does teach you methodologies, how to minimize the risks to safety. A little bit of historical background here. In 1994, the FAA engaged the University of Texas to do some academic research at quite a high level um, on human factors and they were looking specifically at flight safety on the flight deck of aircraft. So this is mainly for professional pilots. The research that came from this led to the development of threat and error management. As you might expect, the, an audit was undertaken to try and measure what we actually had. And they ran into a few problems immediately. And that was that safety issues weren't really openly discussed because people in that environment were scared or scared of uh, some consequences. You now they might lose their jobs um, and or be thought very badly or, or not get promoted perhaps because they owned up to uh, making some errors or other. And the other aspect of this was that just knowing how many times something happens isn't enough. You really need to understand the context and what led up to the instance each time. So from this now obvious conclusion, the development of a more open approach to flight safety was observed. And, and I would encourage all pilots now to be very open about. No one's going to lambast you if you own up to making an error that could have been dangerous. You can all learn from the mistakes. After the four years later, the uh, uh, TEM trial was put in place amongst the um, uh, airlines involved, and they noticed a huge improvement in flight safety, massive. Uh, and uh, that led the ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, and the FAA to endorse threat and error management as industry best practice. Um, and that then led to TEM being recognized worldwide. That bled in turn into general aviation, um, and that's where we are. And then this here is an extract of the, um, the legal requirements for the syllabus for a sailplane pilot. And I've highlighted the bit that's important. The sailplane SPL flight instruction syllabus should take into account the principles of threat and error management, TEM. And of course, for, if for no other reason, we need to know what that is exactly. Threat and error management has three basic building blocks. Threats, which we'll discuss in a minute, errors, and the undesired aircraft state. So we just have these three things which we need to understand exactly what they are. So we're going to go about just explaining what a threat and error and an undesired aircraft state is. Threats are really outside of your control. There's nothing you can do about them, they're just there. So they come in invited or not, they're there. 
it has a rather formal definition, uh, which, uh, but basically it means that it's not in your control. It's outside of your control or any, or your uh, flight crew, if you have more than one person in the plane. It increases the complexity of the flight in some way, and it requires your attention. If you don't pay attention to it, um, it's going to reduce safety margins. So we can look at the sorts of threats that we might see, and you can see here, I've broken them into three distinct groups, external threats, internal threats, and what are called latent threats. So an external threat is perhaps things like the weather, the airfield and its design. The club system, the club operational system can sometimes influence you know, pressures on uh, getting the launch, launch rate up or something. The aircraft issues themselves, you know, is it correctly assembled? Uh, are there any malfunctions on it, which can obviously reduce safety margins? Then we have things like social interactions. In gliding, this is a very big deal. We're, we're part of a social group. We all do this for fun, and we enjoy the social side as much as anything else. And, and of course, that in turn means that you might be being distracted from the, from the uh, functions and procedures that you need to follow. Internal threats are about you. So there's nothing much you can do about it. If you're ill, you're ill. So it's still a threat in that sense. It's outside of your control, but you can decide if you are going, how, how you're going to mitigate that. Um, so the CAA have um, a nice acronym which covers most of it. I am safe, illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and eating. But also the, the uh, other aspects, fixation, so all of these human factors, fixation, distraction, how um, current are you, and, and so on, are you in current practice. The latent threats are um, where we have fundamentally things like optical illusions, where things aren't quite the way we think they are, so we make an approach on an upslope being field, for instance, we can get a, a, a miss. We can be misled with um, our uh, in imagining our height, and if we're too high or too low on the approach, is an example. I'm sure you can think of many more threats, and I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. Just try to lay out the sort of direction these things come from. Threat management is how we anticipate these and how we manage them. Errors, on the other hand, come from the pilot or the crew, and they are in your control. They have a definition, and that is they're either actions or inactions, so things you didn't do or things you did do, um, uh, which lead to a deviation from the flight plan. This, in turn, reduces the flight, you know, the, the flight safety margins, and increases the probability of, of a problem. So let's just look at the types of errors that we might make. And again, I've broken these down into groups. So they can be related in some way to handling the aircraft in the air, its speed, height, and so on. It can be you making an error of simply flying when you're not fit enough to fly or you're not prepared in some way to fly. Your instruments in the aircraft giving you incorrect in data because they've set up incorrectly or they're not even switched on. Procedural area errors where you've failing to follow a procedure in some way, um, or perhaps you've got the center of gravity wrong in the aircraft because you didn't do your checks properly, you didn't follow a checklist, or you deviated in some way from uh, rules or regulations. A communications error is a uh, misunderstanding, and misunderstandings can create problems. So who's in control of the aircraft? Did you understand your briefing properly? And again, these groups of errors are not meant to be an exhaustive list. 
there's more here, I'm sure, and I'm sure that you can think of them. So a little bit more about errors. Errors are inevitable. Everyone makes mistakes. On every single flight, you are bound to make mistakes. It's not going to be perfect. They're also an inevitable part of learning. So if you don't make mistakes, and it's absolutely pointless having a, an instructor, because you might just as well go in the plane and go and fly. So you're going to make mistakes. And it's making the mistakes that typically create the opportunity for you to learn. The more important point is, will you detect an error and respond to it? Will you recognize it and just simply ignore it? See it and think, oh, well, it's not important. I won't, um, I won't be worried about that one then. Will you deliberately make a, an error? Will you deliberately cut a corner in some way to, just to get things done? They're rushing to get the glider to the launch point, so I won't check that the controls are properly connected. Will you see, see it when the problem escalates or will you see it earlier? So will it take the problem to become much more serious before you actually detect it? Or maybe you won't even see it at all. And I will give you an example of that later in the tutorial. During the study, the uh, original LOSA study, 45% of the errors that were uh, noticed by the auditors were not noticed or responded to by the pilots involved. That's quite a scary figure, isn't it? Nearly half of them. And if you don't detect an error, of course, you're not going to put, put it right because you don't even know you've got something to do. The undesired aircraft state is a situation resulting from an error. Uh, and that error is, a, 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 or an, so it's either an action or an inaction by the crew, and it's reduced the safety margin. It doesn't mean crash. It does not mean that you are now um, a, a going to crash, but you are really getting um, close to the margins now, and now you have to do something. So the formal definition of an undesired aircraft state is that the aircraft is either in the wrong place, it's flying at the wrong speed, it's in the wrong attitude, or it's in the wrong configuration. It's probably resulted from a flight crew error in some way, and the safety margins are now reduced. So ineffective error management leads to this undesired aircraft state where the aircraft is now not in a position it should be. So let's have a look at some examples of that. A winch launch, something you may have seen um, uh, happen on the winch launch, on the ground run, the wing touches the ground. Now that's an undesired aircraft state. That's not what we want to happen. It might have over rotated. It might, um, uh, you might have followed some sort of incorrect recovery from a launch failure. And they're the classics and they're the big ones. Equally on an aero being out position, wing going down, lifting the tail of the tap. These are all undesired uh, aircraft states. In the circuit, you're either possibly uh, in the wrong configuration. So I keep talking about the wheel, but you didn't put the wheel down. That would be a good example. You're out of position in some way or flying at the wrong speed or there's conflicting traffic, which is um, uh, potentially on a collision course with you. The approach itself, poor brake settings, um, unstable approach, low speeds, firm landings and so on are all undesired aircraft states. Cross country, wandering into airspace, you're in the wrong place now, that's an undesired aircraft state. Altimeter setting, so you've got the wrong data that you're working with, can be have a serious consequence. Late field selection or, or just being lost. And I'm sure, again, you can think of lots more situations than I've listed here. 
the undesired aircraft state can still be managed. It's not the end of the uh, chain, chain of events that lead to a, an incident, but and you can intervene here and, and sort it out. But if you mismanage the undesired aircraft state, you're now complicating the situation, and the undesired aircraft state is going to get worse, and that will lead to potentially to an incident or an accident. So for us, we have certain safeguards, we put them in place um, and, uh, and we can split those down. Uh, we call them mitigations in the gliding world. We can put them into two groups, basically hard safeguards and soft safeguards. And the hard safeguards are typically wired in. They're associated in some way with the design of the aircraft. Um, so automatic control connections would be a very good example, um, undercarriage warning systems and so on to help uh, reduce the risk of, of making mistakes here. Um, uh, the soft safeguards are more about regulations that are in place. So uh, standard operating procedures and checklists. A checklist as an example is a way of uh, ensuring or trying to minimize the risk that you'll forget to do something important before you take off, lock in the canopy for instance. Maintenance schedules for the aircraft do the same. We have a procedure and a time frame we work to so that we don't allow things to wear too far before they're picked up and uh, sorted out. We also have licensing standards uh, and um, training to maintain pilot proficiency even once he's qualified. But none of these things work if you don't use them. So, uh, you know, a checklist won't be of any use to you unless you follow it. So now we can talk about you and what you need. So your competencies and you need to be able to anticipate the possibilities. And that's a moving feast depends on the circumstances and the context that you're in. But you need to be able to anticipate what might happen. You need to be able to recognize the event when it does happen, and you need to be able to recover from that. So you need some sort of plan. And normally that's, to a large part, part of your training. So you're taught how to deal with the more common or the more routine um, situations. And we often see people who are not able to anticipate. They can't, they're not thinking ahead. And you can see it. You can see it on the road. Drivers arrive at a, a roundabout, come to a stop, have a look to see if it's clear, then drive on. And a more experienced or better driver, perhaps, is already figuring out what's happening on the roundabout as he approaches the roundabout. Uh, and in anticipation, you should expect things to go wrong. So examples of anticipation, uh, which is proceduralized, is uh, considering eventualities before you take off it is actually built into a procedure. But um, looking around you at the launch point, you know, perhaps you've got a trainee on the wingtip. Now, there is a possibility he might get his job wrong. You might notice that the cloud bases are coming down. Now, is that going to have some sort of impact on your flight? There might be a crosswind, and you might need to think about what impact that has, perhaps on takeoff and landing and the flight in general. Interruptions are a common one, so daily inspections, and you, you no, know, just simply having a headache. Uh, um, you need to think about the consequences of that before you fly. Recognition is another thing. How soon will you actually spot that the problems occurred? So if you're lost, it might take you a while to figure out that you're actually lost because you weren't lost before, but now suddenly you are. When did that happen then? So you had a period of time where you were lost, but you didn't actually realize. When will you spot that the other glider that appears to be on a collision course, he's actually hasn't seen you? And it's down to you, you need to sort it out. If you have a launch failure on a winch, 
how long will it take you to figure that out? You haven't got a big bang now. How long will it take you to realise that that is a launch failure? It's not just a little reduction in power. Events on the ground may affect your, um, uh, your landing choices and they'll be changing. How will you know you're about to enter cloud? When will you spot that you're drifting steadily away from the airfield and at some point you may not get back? You can only put these things, problems right, when you've spotted that they are actually there. So this recognition thing is terribly important. Recovery, you need to have a plan. How to deal with that distraction? Can you follow a procedure um, to put things right? And very often you can. And will you fixate on problem one and not spot problem number two, which I will come to in a moment? Training flights themselves have their own sets of threat and error management issues. So for the trainee, well, you're expected, we expect you to make errors. Everyone makes them anyway, but we expect you to make your fair share. And your instructor will give you space. He'll allow you to work it out for yourself if you can. He would prefer that. So he will want to put the minimum of intervention in, keeping the flight within safety limits. And of course, if you go outside, or there's a risk of you going outside of the safety limits, then he will uh, intervene. Threats for the instructor are, are, of course, errors that you might make. So a little chain there. And you can make errors together. So you can both fail to see the other aircraft that's going to, you're going to collide with. So you must join in in the training flights and point out to the instructor if he's at risk of making an error himself. There have been many occasions when my pupil has thankfully told me that I'm doing something stupid um, and you shouldn't be shy of doing that. And your instructor should be perfectly happy for you to point it out and keep him out of trouble. So example number one in my set of examples, undertaking a daily inspection. This is a flight safety, a flight critical task. And a, mem a member of the club starts talking to you, maybe you know, a mate of yours. What are you going to do? Are you going to allow this distraction? You're just going to carry on chat to him and do the job? I wouldn't advise it. Will you realise that you're being distracted? And will you have a plan? Now, how you handle it doesn't matter too much as long as you do handle it. So you might go off and have a cup of coffee with him uh, if you haven't seen him for ages uh, and then go back and start the daily inspection again. Or you might just tell him to go away um, politely um, and uh, because you're busy doing an important inspection. Here's another one. You're in circuit and you're preparing to land. And you spot someone walking across the landing area and you think, ah, oh, I meant to land there and, and that's not looking good. So I have to keep an eye on that. I'm going to need to, I'll make another plan. I'm going to land behind it. And then you spot he stops and he walks back the other way and you think, ah, oh, hmm, can I have to change that plan again? And then he stops again and does something different. He starts running up the airfield. And you think, what? Now where's he going? And while you're confused and muddled and trying to figure out what the hell's going on, everything goes dark. And sometime later you wake up with a doctor peering at you in a hospital while you're in a hospital bed, explaining to you that you're involved in a mid-air collision. A really horrible thought. But these things happen. So just because you have you know, the first problem, please don't fixate on it. You need to consider what else is going on as well. Another example here is denial. We can sometimes just refuse to accept the fact um, that we have a problem. So in this example, we're flying cross country, doesn't matter where it is, and you expect to see a big town appear, and it does, and you see a big town. And when you arrive, the layout isn't quite what you expected. So you try to make it all, you think, well, that's not right. I mean, the, 
it's source, but there should be a cathedral there and it's not. And perhaps they've just taken it away for repairs or something or ar architectural salvage perhaps um, or cleaning. How long is it gonna take you to fess up to yourself and say, hey, you know what, I'm lost. Because until you accept in your own mind that you are lost, you're not going to do anything about it. Once you accept the fact you're lost, you can follow, follow the lost procedures, which is for another briefing. But you can follow that procedure because then you know what to do and you're going to get on and do it. Before we finish, I'm going to share with you just one more true story. While I was the CFI at Talgarth, we had a cross-country pilot returning from the north about 10 nautical miles away from the airfield, 20 kilometres. He had 3,000 feet indicated on his altimeter, so he decided that that was a safe time to start a final glide back to the airfield. What he didn't realise, and didn't realise until after the accident, his altimeter was set to QNH and not QFE. And that makes about a thousand foot difference, Talgarth being almost a thousand feet above sea level. For the entire glide, he didn't realise that he was um, uh, set on the wrong altimeter setting and he was basing all of his assumptions on incorrect data. He didn't fully appreciate the depth of the problem, so the aircraft was in an undesired aircraft state throughout the glide. When he arrived at Talgarth, he appreciated he couldn't get into the airfield because he was below the level of it. Uh, and unless he could climb, uh, he was destined to land in a field. So he left himself very little time, therefore, to figure out the wind, select a field to land in, take into account the slopes, figure out a circuit and land. And that didn't have a happy ending. So thankfully, he walked away from the crash, but the aircraft hit a hedge uh, and was very badly damaged. And my point here is that the accident itself was shown as um, a pilot left the decision for landing in the field too late, which of course is true. Um, so the accident report's not wrong, but you and I know that there's more to it than that. And that was the whole point that the um, LOSA study realize right at the beginning is we can't just look at numbers sometimes we need to understand the context so now just to summarize threat and error management threats you can't do anything about you can't change them but you can manage them errors are a very common occurrence and they need to be managed and the undesired aircraft state is the result normally and typically of a mismanaged error your skill sets, what you need to develop are the ability to anticipate, to be ready for the situations, recognize them when they occur and have a plan to recover. So if anyone wants to, if you like to uh, delve into this more deeply, a lot of this material uh, in this briefing came from the work of Ashley Merritt and Clinette, both doctorates, uh, uh, and they wrote an article called Defensive Flying for Pilots to try and simplify the rationale for threat and error management for general aviation. So it's a very good, simple document. If you Google that, you'll find it. If you want to go in more deeply, uh, then uh, by all means you can. And then Principles of Threat and Error Management for Helicopter Pilots, which is an EASA publication, is extremely good, but it's very deep and um, takes a little bit of reading. So anyway, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.